published three more books just to introduce all of that. The Rebel Sultans, Dekan from Khilji to Sibaji 2018, the quotations, the uh, Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin tales from Indian history that was published in 2019, and most recently, of course, False Lies, that is India's Maharajas in the age of Rupa Brahma. He served as a, a chief of staff to Dr. Sasi Tarur, uh, and he has in the past worked uh, at the House of Lords in Britain and with the BBC on their incarnation history series, right? Uh, with, uh, I think this book talk we have organized in a little bit different format. It will be more of a, a scholarly discussion that will be moderated by uh, Professor Chinmay Timber. Professor Chinmay Timber, of course, is a professor in economics area and who has a lot of interest in uh, business history. So over to you, Professor Chinmay. Uh, thank you so much. Great pleasure to host Dr. Manu Pillai. I say doctor now because he uh, got his PhD uh, just, I think, a few months back. Uh, what is the name of your thesis? It's a, it's a long name. In fact, I don't think I remember fully, but one day it will be a book. Okay. Not anytime soon, because people tend to turn their theses into books quite quickly, whereas I'm very determined to do it five years into the future. Yeah. So I've embargoed it for five years, and then five years into the future, I turn it into a book. Okay. But what's the name? Of the, I, the name is it's Rajas Rani's Deity and Company. Uh, it's about the East India Company and uh, Princely Travancore in the early 19th century. So the ivory throne dealt with the 20th century. For the thesis, I went back by 100 years and talked about the sort of divine kingship in that was constructed in the 18th century, clashing with colonial power and how that ended up altering local politics and court dynamics in Kerala in the early 19th century. Let's start with that. You know, uh, you do have roots in Kerala and uh, mostly also uh, you know, raised in Pune. Uh, the first book, Ivory Throne, which is hugely, you know, widely acclaimed, multiple editions and translation and so on. Uh, very briefly, you know, what really excited you about that project? And looking back now, because this is almost a decade since the book came out, you know, how do you see the book having shaped the conversation on the history of this particular period? Well, one thing that was that turned out very well for me was there wasn't much on Kerala in the English language written in an accessible style for many, many years. Uh, the last person who did do uh, books on Kerala was K.M. Panikar. That was decades ago. And there was a gap, I thought. that So this book, in a sense, ended up filling that gap. And that's why I suppose it was a commercial success because people were anxious to read something on Kerala that wasn't necessarily academic in terms of the writing, but at the same time had something interesting to say. The, the reason I wanted to do something on Kerala was because I am a Malayali, but I was raised in Pune, as you said. So although I can read and write Marathi with ease, with Malayalam, I struggle, but I can speak Malayalam in a very homely kind of Malayalam. But every year we would go to Kerala for our summer vacations. And there, this is something I've told Malayali audiences very often that in our backyard, it's our ancestral village, right? So in our backyard, we had a private family temple and it used to be in ruins. And just the stories around it were fascinating. For example, the, the, god the temple had two goddesses. One was Vanadurga. Vanadurga is a goddess of the grove. So Vanadurga does not want a ceiling or a roof. Vanadurga wants to be exposed to the rain and the wind and the sun and all of that. And it was very clear that this was some kind of tribal goddess that perhaps existed there before. And we had co-opted uh, this goddess into our system because the other goddess, Bhadrakali, is a much more let's say, Brahmanized goddess. She has a proper temple, there are proper pujas done to her, etc. So two very different kinds of deities in that temple. Then there was a deity nobody knew anything about. It was called Airaveli Munodi. And even now, my own grandmother has no clue who this god is. I did some research and found out that there was a tribe called the Koravar. And this was a deity that they worshipped. And it turned out that after I discovered this, my grandmother said, actually, I've heard that Koravars used to stay here and our family kicked them out. So we kicked out the people, but we kept their deity because I'm assuming we were afraid the deity would do something to us. So that one temple itself was speaking multiple stories, right, of a community that existed there, but were removed by somebody else. Their deity managed to stay on as, as a token representation, two different goddesses representing two different styles of worship, one Brahmanized, one not so Brahmanized. Uh, the, the whole village community, the kind of language, the songs. When we were kids in the 90s, there were still farming activities happening there. And as kids coming from the city, our favorite thing the moment we landed was to run through the fields without chappals and just you know, sort of rolling about in the muck. So from that personal experience of being there, I started asking questions. 
my questions originally about the village my own family my ancestors i was blessed with a grandmother who was very direct about lots of things she didn't tell me sweet versions of story she told me the the uncensored truth of naughty great aunts and you know great uncles who had illegitimate children and all kinds of all kinds of odd and awkward things that normally grandmothers wouldn't tell their grandsons but i found it and i started thinking of these people no longer as my great grandmother but as individuals which made me more interested in their lives which made me more interested in the region and from there i ended up on on political history of the broader region itself which was south kerala or travancore and uh, it was a princely state which uh, opened up its own conundrum because in school we were reading in history textbooks about the freedom struggle how the british had colonized india and so on and yet for my grandmother and my grandfather they had never lived under british rule they lived under an indian rulers rule even though the raj was around the raj was not a direct presence in their lives so i started reading more on travancore and this whole princely ecosystem my first book and the fourth book uh, cover that and from there i found this fascinating character a female figure who had ruled travancore in the 1920s done things that didn't go down well for example she championed the rights of minorities there such as the syrian christians she she put into places of authority marginalized groups such as the iravas and for that the dominant nayars etc there was a pushback and this lady had essentially been written out of history she had been footnoted as if it was just a a brief interlude that had no lasting substance and i discovered that even her personal arc you know a queen at the age of 5 almost seen as a living goddess in kerala and from there by the age of 60 she leaves she goes off to bangalore and spends the next 25 years of her life as a complete non entity just shrimati setu lakshmi bai that was her final name and that's how she called herself in the last days whereas for most of her life she had been her high initially padmanabha sevani vanchi dharma vardhini raj rajeshwari maharani pura adam tirunal setu lakshmi bai article muta tamburan you know so <laughs> that was the just the transition yeah. of a political figure yeah. from occupying semi divine status to becoming somebody who dies in such an ordinary way which is barely noticed and is cremated in an electric crematorium in bangalore like anybody else but who began her life with a 21 gun salute and her birthdays were these great things and every temple in the state did pujas for her and all of that just that transition of a political figure who gave up power sort of fascinated me and, in its own right and how does the, the the descendants of this royalty now view the book i'm really interested in that uh one or has branch, it pushed back or has they they have they loved it hated it you know i got a 5 crore defamation notice so <laughs> one can say that some of them certainly didn't like five it 5 crore okay yeah yeah which was uh, not something you want to get the with your first That's book that's why you're writing right? many books <laughs> yeah i need to earn i suppose to to pay whenever this happens no but I, i gave it right back because i hadn't pulled any stories out of thin air these came out of solid archives they came out of intelligence reports they came out of their own diaries their own papers which luckily happened to be available uh one set of people so you'll see two ladies on the cover the 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 lady i think sitting on the right side she her family and her descendants did not cooperate because they realized that i was not going to write a book that was praise and all the all the cool romantic things about royalty it was a more critical engagement with how king- kingship was constructed how it was basically an edifice of power in which caste is enmeshed religion is enmeshed all kinds of forms of social control are enmeshed so there was nothing romantic about anything i was writing so they didn't cooperate so that's the one gap in the book that these people were alive to the 1980s both these women were alive till the 1980s so i was very determined that i should meet their descendants and people who knew them whether it was a nurse who took care of them in their final days because the insight you get from somebody who sees you in a vulnerable position towards the end of your life even if you're a queen or a king or a prime minister or whoever when you're a vulnerable person in the last days of your life the insight the people around you have is very different from say a courtier's insight or a family member's insight because they see through you know lots of things so i wanted to meet as many people as possible but they didn't cooperate this one side and they sent me the defamation notice and, and what's been a heartwarming story of people in kerala or outside kerala reaching out to you you know saying that any any interesting anecdotes and lots of malayalis like myself who grew up outside the state seem to have connected with the book but also lots of malayalis in the state because once it was translated into malayalam it became this big thing mm. uh more than the english version the english version of course did well outside kerala and among nrks as we called but in kerala the malayalam translation also took a life of its own and uh, suddenly people wanted to do like tv interviews and things like that i refused to be a bobbing head on news channels but i agreed to do some other stuff and you could see there was an appetite and it sort of also convinced me and gave me some energy to do my second book rebel sultans because 
there was this feeling right that people don't read anymore people aren't interested in history anymore but i was getting feedback from very young people but also older people but equally like kids in college high school people like that were reading a 700 page book on an obscure character who had died in the 80s written by an obscure boy i was a boy in those days i was 25 years old uh, i wouldn't use the Still word up. anymore but <laughs> you know so the very fact that a giant book that was fairly expensive we couldn't publish it originally in hardback because then the price would have been double 1200 rupees which nobody would have bought so even at paperback 700 pages small print 245000 word manuscript i didn't even the publishers didn't think anybody would actually end up buying it so 3000 copies was the first print run uh but then no people did buy it so then i realized actually there is an appetite there is a market there are people who are interested in history and they are interested in history told in a way that people can connect to and to me that's one of the main things in the work i do which is that history is not merely about scrutinizing the past critical inquiry all that matters but if we are to really make it come alive and get people to take an interest then it has to also be communicated in a way that brings people into it yeah. uh, we we lament too often that you know oh there's so much misinterpretation of history there's so much politicization of history but unless historians themselves make the effort to reach out and make history accessible there's no point complaining about that because who else is filling the gap yeah and you're doing it quite interestingly because the danger of course is to make it accessible often you get up you get what a hagiography so it's very simple to go from you know to try and make something accessible you go and you know have a very uncritical celebration of the subject matter uh i know for a lot of keralites uh, north india means everything north of kerala uh, not north of maharashtra you know everything north of kerala can be north indian but seeing your journey in terms of writing you know you started with this one region travanco and then you moved it to cover a much wider region the deccan uh, and that's the book which came out in 2018 uh called rebel sultans beautiful book uh he just signed my personal copy so if you have a personal copy you know get it signed uh after this uh tell us a bit about that you know the book starts off very nicely it says most books on the deck you know begin with shivaji uh this book kind of ends with shivaji it tells you the back story of what happens uh before that uh how did you know what was the spark for that uh and again one or two interesting nuggets you know from that journey The spark was simply that I grew up in the Deccan, right? So when we were in school, uh, history textbooks spoke, of course, a lot about the Marathas. But there were these cameo appearances. You'd have one Nizam Shah named here, one Adil Shah of Bijapur named there, and the other obsession was the Mughals. So Deccan history was reduced to this titanic clash between uh, the Chhatrapati and between Aurangzeb, the emperor from the north. And as if that before that there was no history. If there was, it tended to be a medieval kind of history. People spoke about the Yadavas, etc. So there was a gap there. and i thought it was a very interesting gap because the four main uh, dynasties or rather the three main dynasties of the of the deccan mostly were shia oriented they were not sunni muslims they were persia oriented they didn't look at the mughals as their suzerains they looked at the shah of iran as their suzerains uh they had very interesting genealogies so the the nizam shahs of ahmednagar originated with a brahmin who converts to islam uh over the next few generations they not only marry local maharashtrian women from the region but also end up marrying persian women and african women so there were at least two begums in ahmednagar who were black women we don't think of indian history and think of africans playing a role in it we're in ahmedabad and there's a big mosque here that was built by an african siddhi sayed mosque uh the 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 adil shahs of bijapur another fascinating story a man who comes from persia he's a basic adventurer a military kind of guy gets a job here rises to become a governor ends up marrying a maratha woman and spawns a dynasty that is part maratha part persian and you see in different generations they start switching so the second adil shah is very persianized very shia very committed to all that but ibrahim adil shah the second who's akbar's contemporary in the deccan and essentially has similar interests and so on he sees himself as a sunni muslim but a maharashtrian he doesn't take that much interest in persian as a language he prefers marathi he calls himself son of saraswati and ganapati uh, that's his famous you know uh, claim to fame and uh, other lots of interesting characters like that. the qutub shahs of golconda if you go to go- hyderabad now it's all dominated by the nizams but the nizams made a real effort to wipe out what the qutub shahs had created before them even though they didn't destroy the charminar luckily but a lot of the palaces a lot of what the qutub shahis had built was 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 wiped off Uh, but the golconda fort is still there and this again is an iraqi dynasty that comes to india marries into telugu uh, marries telugu women teluguizes themselves become patron of telugu poetry and literature and they become local in a certain sense so i thought these this cast of characters itself was interesting there was a lot happening here and i think i also have a slightly political agenda here which is to reorient history from the north a little bit towards the south 
because everything we think about history in some ways you know as they say how things look to you depends on where you're sitting now if i'm oriented around delhi then everything to me is about land based empires invasions from afghanistan that kind of thing but if i'm looking at it from south india it's a peninsula it's trading people have always come here people have always gone out uh, cultures religions groups they've always been coming and going it's a much more porous kind of system that exists in the south and the basic example of it is the arrival of islam people think islam arrived in the sindh with the swords being raised in battle in raids and so on but in the south it came through commerce it came through trade so in kerala as a malayali we know that you know in the lifetime of the prophet himself islam is supposed to have come as per legend the oldest mosque is supposed to have been built while the prophet was still alive, alive in arabia now there's no archaeological proof for this but even so by the 9th century a couple of centuries later after the prophet you already have inscriptions where there are arab names and muslim signatures which means islam was powerful enough to be noted in in royal records of that kind so suddenly the that story changes right so from in the north one can understand yes islam did come through invasions but in the south it came in a different way and the islam that came through the sea often adapted to local culture it was not it was not backed by power so in kerala a lot of the muslims became matrilineal like the upper caste hindus so the only royal family in kerala the arakel family which is also the family of the artist yusuf arakel they were matrilineal so the eldest person ruled if it was a girl she ruled as the arakel bivi if it was a boy he ruled as the ali raja of, of arakel and this has got no backing in the sharia it has no backing in islamic law it is entirely a localized version of islam you have you have interaction between religions happening because economically people interacted syrian christians and the muslims basically took the role of vaishyas in kerala and therefore they were seen very much as part of that fabric but the syrian christians is even more uh, more funny because when the portuguese came to kerala they said oh you're christians wonderful your churches belong to us and the pope and the christians said who's the pope we never heard of the pope because they'd been christian long before europe had christianity and they had their bishops etc coming from the eastern church in persia not from not from the catholics so their system was completely different so i thought in general the deccan encapsulated a lot of that the importance of trade we use words like globalization now but the tendency existed always people tend to migrate as you would know people tend to move around ideas tend to flow like that it's not these boundaries as we know them now where you raise fences and you actually guard your frontiers on a daily basis that didn't exist like that in the past there was a lot of it was porous it was more fluid and the deccan encapsulated a lot of that and having grown up there and having felt that you know there needs there is space for a pre maratha story of the deccan i thought i would do rebel sultans yeah th- there is a bit more about the, one of the characters you mentioned this ethiopian warrior king malik ambar in particular and for those who don't know the ime logo which some of you might be wearing ime t-shirts you know the ime logo takes its inspiration from the siddhi ja- uh, siddhi sayed mosque jali uh, which is one of the characters you know that he talks about uh who is this guy called malik ambar and a very fascinating person in history tell us a bit about him so if you read a sanskrit poem called the shiva bharata which was commissioned by chatrapati shivaji himself in the 1670s when he was crowned king of the marathas uh it was written by Kar- kavindra parmananda i think uh in that you see reference to malik ambar popping up every now and then and it's fascinating because here you have the first king of the marathas paying tribute to an african man saying that he's as brave as the sun surya pramane pratapi in the marathi translation um as compares him to kartikeya fighting the asura so malik ambar surrounded by the marathas fought the invaders from the north and there itself there's something interesting right shivaji is often portrayed as this hindu bulwark against the moguls who are seen as an islamic power but shivaji himself in his court poem first acknowledges an earlier generation that stood up to the moguls but 25 years malik ambar was the wall between the conquest of the deccan and the and the moguls and this man was a muslim and he was an african he was born in the mid 1550s or so in into the oromo tribe that's the speculation in ethiopia when he was about 10 years old he was enslaved uh, shipped off to baghdad in baghdad he had a master who converted him to islam and he became ambar so his original name was chapu he becomes ambar ambar then is sold again ends up in the deccan now when he lands in the deccan the person buying him is also a black man a black man who was the peshwa or the prime minister of the sultan of ahmednagar this guy had also come to the deccan as a military slave ended up becoming prime minister and something similar happens with malik ambar he begins as a regular fighter in the army of this peshwa from there he starts rising through the ranks around 80 uh, 1571 his master dies and he's given his freedom from there he becomes for the next 20 odd years this general mercenary he's got about 200 odd 
people with him and their cavalry force. He sells his services to whoever is available. So sometimes he's serving the Bijapur Sultan, sometimes he's in the Ahmednagar Sultanate. Whoever wants him for a price, he will serve. The conquest of the Deccan under the Mughals starts in Akbar's time, late fifteen, uh, second half of the fifteen nineties, and at this time. The, the capital of the Sultanate of Ahmednagar is captured. Ahmednagar falls, uh, the royal family scatters, and there is chaos. In the chaos, um, this Malik Amba starts proving that he is something of a military leader. And people start gravitating towards him because he's capable of leading the resistance. Again, this is not a romantic story. There are others also capable of leading the resistance. He kills them. That's essentially how people behave back in the day. If you don't like somebody as a threat, you get rid of them. So Malik Amba becomes the focus of the resistance from 150, 200 people, he suddenly has 500 people following him. That goes up to 1,000, 3,000, 10,000. And by 1610, he's got some 50,000 people with him. About 20% is Africans, like himself, Habshis as they were called. But the rest is Marathas, including a man called Maluji Bhosle, who happened to be Shivaji's grandfather. So that is now Malik Ambar in his heroic phase. He establishes a city called Kirki, which today we know Aurangabad, because with all the modesty of kings, Aurangzeb conquered and said, let me name it after myself. Uh, so now it's, uh, it's Aurangabad, now it's Sambhaji Nagar because Sambhaji was murdered nearby. So it commemorates him. So he establishes a city. He faces one defeat from the Mughals, which is a little serious, but mostly he holds his own. And he essentially with the Maratha, Shivaji's grandfather, pioneers the system called Bargigiri. Bargigiri is what is now called popularly guerrilla warfare, which Shivaji then masters in his generation and uses to great effect against the Mughals. But the pattern was set originally by Malik Ambar. And you can see directly that Shivaji claims, and Shivaji obviously in Shiva Bharata, the poem, he actually admits a certain political inspiration from Malik Ambar. He sees himself as a successor to that political battle against the Mughals, where Malik Ambar left off. Shivaji's father tried to actually continue that battle. Uh, he picked up the Nizam Shahi state after that, tried to hold on. But Shivaji's father couldn't succeed. He was defeated by the Mughals and he moved to Bijapur and served in Bijapur. Shivaji then resurrects the same political project and succeeds. He finally kicks the Mughals out of the region, creates the Maratha Swaraj and breaks the back of the Mughal empire in the process. So you have an interesting thing where an African man who comes here as a slave, becomes a warrior, becomes a mercenary, becomes a kingmaker, then ends up inspiring this young boy growing up in another part of Maharashtra, who then leads the battle forward and changes Indian history. And Malik Amba wasn't the only African. Siddhi Sayyid Mosque, of course, was created by an African nobleman based here in Gujarat. In Uttar Pradesh and Jaunpur, there were Africans in power, I think, around the 15th or 16th century. In Bengal, for seven, eight years, in the, in the early modern period, Africans were in power. So African presence, in, if you go further back, Delhi Sultanate, Razia Sultan, one of the reasons ostensibly for her murder in, in Delhi in the 13th century, 12th century, 13th century, I think, was because she had an, an African lover called Yakut. So again, Africans are present already in the Delhi Sultanate. This itself is something we don't hear about. This The black people and their sort of contribution to Indian history. And these people didn't come with wives to India. They ended up marrying local women and in a sense, dissolving into local uh, society. So a lot of people, more people than we think today might actually end up having African blood, thanks to these warriors who used to come from Ethiopia. Absolutely fascinating. Just one person and, you know, how it inspires later on Shivaji and Marathas as well. Uh, I mean, and also, of course, you mentioned Africans in India, but Indians in Africa, you know, we're we are, we are in Gujarat right now. And Gujarat has this very, very old connection of traders and merchants uh, flying the, the African routes, uh, huge connections between all these continents uh, throughout the last thousand years. Uh, I'll just pick on one of the things you said uh, and connect to one of the themes that we've, you know, we've titled this talk as the, the, the present, the past and the present, uh, name changing, right? So you mentioned this thing about uh, Aurangabad, uh, Aurangabad and uh, this thing, but how do you see it? It's, it's become a big political hotspot today, right? Everyone wants to change names. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think when Mayavati is in power, she named a lot of districts uh, with a very Buddhist kind of touch. Uh, now you have Yogi Ji in power, again, a, a very different touch. How do you as a historian see this? A, do you think names should be changed at all? Uh, and B, you know, is, are there some guiding principles you know, for this? You know, it's a very interesting question. One I have grappled with without a very convincing solution in my own head. There was a time when I was against it as a blanket thing. I thought it was unnecessary, leave things as they are. 
but i don't know how many of you noticed a few years ago in the uk there was this whole thing about toppling statues right of people who got colleges named after them scholarships named after them but a lot of their money came from slave trading and things like that so it's complicated history and there is a feeling that these statues should be toppled some statues are toppled into canals and lakes and things like that and that also disturbed me because in a sense now you translate that kind of precedent to india then people will find a justification for ruining mosques and breaking things down saying that this is an imperialistic religion that came from outside so that precedent did not sit well for me i didn't think that even in the uk you should be toppling statues violently pulling them down throwing them into lakes that to me signified something a bit sketchy uh, but there were some people who said no maybe we should remove these and put them in a museum and admit that look these people were considered great then but this is how we are appraising their past and their contributions now which seemed a, a fairer kind of thing but in this broader debate there were some scholars who argued that look even the pushing of these statues into the lakes and canals is the making of history it is a history happening in front of our eyes it is a historical process happening and while i wasn't fully convinced at some level i realized that the mayavati example that you gave right she's been elected into power she represents the voice of a people not just the people who voted her in but also a certain community that was marginalized and what she's doing is not mere here and now politics she's making a statement she's trying to make something that is historical in nature the question is is that legitimate or not there is no easy answer to that because it's a complicated question so there i i, I was a bit torn between between two ends of the of the debate and i don't think since then i've come up with a more convincing answer because even with the naming of cities frankly when aurangabad was renamed i understand because aurangzeb and the moguls did come into the deccan as invaders as i said it wasn't a hindu muslim clash because even a malikambar even these muslim sultans of the deccan resisted aurangzeb and resisted the moguls by shivaji's time in fact you find shivaji himself speaking of a regional patriotism so when he he allies with the qutub shah of golconda to fight the moguls he talks about dakhniness like being from the deccan this being our homeland and the moguls being invaders by that yardstick yes aurangzeb came here as an invader he did kill shivaji's son in a brutal fashion and one can see why for local people in that region to have a city named after a man who invaded and invaded in a rather blood rather bloody fashion would be troublesome it would not be something they would be comfortable with for me then however i would have preferred it to be named after malikambar because he established the city kirki was a village he was built the city there which meant that as the founder of the city i would have preferred the founder's name to be on it people want to rename hyderabad to bhagnagar that i wouldn't support because hyderabad was created by the qutub shahi sultans it was a planned city and they consciously named it hyderabad the founder named it it is their business what they want to name it and what that that is the name that should stick but aurangabad i understand the logic of wanting to change so i think a lot of this is specific to context and where and who and what but that also makes it messy right if it starts in one place then other people will want to do it more people will come up with flimsy excuses because once you set a precedent it becomes a precedent so then ultimately my final thing is leave things as they are i don't think at this juncture we are in a position to do this in a mature serious way renaming and naming simply becomes a handle to do politics a lot of it is vindictive politics not a politics of closure but a politics of revenge that i think is problematic uh, it's not renaming simply because we're interested in the aesthetics or i want malikamba the founder to be celebrated it's not that positive gloss that's being given it is a politics of vengeance the the issue is really we are taking revenge on the past and as any historian will tell you you cannot take revenge on the past i mean you may want to it may make you feel nice for a brief 5 seconds but you cannot change the past so yeah it's a complex uh, subject so that, that's interesting and you know today we are sitting here at i am and the bug uh in the future it might be the bharat institute of karnavati right bharat, bharat institute of management karnavati are you allowed to say that uh, yeah. <laughs> no no i i mean amdavad and karnavati is a hot hot potato issue in in amdavad uh, the only thing is imk has already been taken by koi code so we can't be an imk so we'll i think we'll stick with the ima brand uh, and see the malayali is always first with these <laughs> and if i'm not mistaken even when they when bombay became mumbai you know it's still called iit bombay so i think the, the high IIT courts right madras yeah. bombay high court is so still not quite changed those names uh, yet but it's a very important and burning kind of a political issue uh, his next book then was you know a collection of his essays published uh, he used to write a wonderful column we all missed this column in the mint uh, the newspaper where he would write in a column on you know some really interesting aspect of indian history and that was collated into this you know wonderful book which has this curious word italian brahmin in the title of the book so the question obviously you know who is this italian brahmin tell us a bit very fascinating title and captivating title 
So, you know, earlier I was talking about how in the South, even when religions from outside the subcontinent came, they would often blend into local cultural forms. And, you know, imagine there's a cultural template. And even if the Hindus have made that template, religions coming in will also occupy the same template because that's how they get into society and that's how they're accepted also. Because then it's not as disruptive. Then you're selling a certain religious idea, yes, but you're not upsetting the social dynamics of that place. So in Kerala, if you look at even the coming of St. Thomas, as per legend, he came in 52 EC and, and, and sort of converted people to Christianity way back. Uh, and the Syrian Christians of Kerala, the Nasranis, as they used to be called, once converted, they didn't convert any more people. In fact, they turned into a caste group. They saw themselves as elite Christians. They had the same privileges as upper caste uh, uh, Hindus. They would not eat with other, other Christians. So Catholics, for example, they would not sit and eat with Catholics in a certain period. Uh, lower caste converts, absolutely not, because they saw themselves as high caste. So they turned into almost a Hinduized local Christian community. And the stories are very interesting, right? Because you have St. Thomas coming and sitting with the goddess of Kodungallur and having a debate with her about religion. And then the goddess sort of gets up and runs back to her shrine and St. Thomas runs behind her. It's a little bit of a Krishna chasing the gopis kind of uh, vibe that you get from it. And that's not done in an insulting way or anything. It is a way to make St. Thomas familiar in that system. Uh, Kali and, and saints like St. George used to be treated as siblings in Kerala festivals. Uh, Muslim nerchas in Kerala used to have, you know, the same drummers as in temples, the same masons, the same architects built churches as well as the mosques and, 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 and temples. So it was all, you know, a similar ecosystem. And this, the Portuguese come and interrupt because the Portuguese have come not just with religion, but also with power. So in Goa, we know that they were extremely brutal. They did smash a lot of temples. Uh, they did uh, have a lot of communities leave the place. You have goddesses and gods being taken away. You have people leaving all the way going down to Mangalore. Some people are going into Kerala, migrating because of religious persecution. You've got all of that happening. Now, in this time, this uh, there's an Italian who was born in the 1570s called Roberto de Nobili. He's born into a, an aristocratic family. He's got a holy Roman emperor up his family tree. He's got, uh, you know, uh, other like grand people in his family. But instead of continuing as the eldest son of a noble family, he decides to become a priest, uh, a missionary. And he lands in India and he realizes that this whole Portuguese formula is not working. Firstly, force is not working very well. The only people the Portuguese are managing to convert are either marginalized Hindus of lower caste communities or as happened in Tamil Nadu, fishing communities, etc. The Paravas in Tamil Nadu converted not because they were convinced by the message of Christ, but because the Portuguese offered them economic protection in the pearl fishing sector. That's why they converted. And this is all well-established fact. So this guy says, look, I'm not here to force people or any of that. I want to teach them my religion. So he goes inland. He leaves the coast where the Portuguese have their guns and their, and their ships. And he goes to Madurai. If you want to Madurai, even now, grand temple even grand uh, Italian style uh, uh, structure built by Tirumala Nayaka in the same period, these massive Corinthian pillars, I don't know what they're doing in South India, this Italian style architecture, but there it is. It's a very dominant, powerful Hindu state that is that is there in Madure. Now, in this Madure, where he lands, obviously, he's not going to be able to convert people either with the gun or by posing as a foreigner. So he brahmanizes himself. He starts wearing a pumul or a sacred thread. He starts wearing the saffron robes and or the rather the lungi that we wear in South India, the dhoti. Um, he starts teaching the Bible not as a foreign book, but as the fifth Veda. He learns Sanskrit. He learns Tamil. He actually engages with scholars and uh, religious mendicants and professionals in South India. And he basically tells people, look, all I'm saying is, here is my new religious message. Your coming into the church is not going to mean you're going to lose your social identity. So if you're a Brahmin with a Poonul and a Kurumi, you can keep your tuft of hair. You can keep your Poonul. You can stay a vegetarian. I'm not going to insist on any of, the, of these things. On the contrary, he becomes a vegetarian. He starts sitting on the floor with his legs crossed, eating out of a plantain leaf. He would have food that only Brahmins cooked because he was trying to merge into that local culture and that local system. And the result was not very many Brahmins necessarily converted, but a lot of upper caste groups converted, uh, you know, middle level, peasant caste, aristocracy, that level. He converts the brother of a local governor and so on. So he has success in that way. And this ironically ends up upsetting people in Rome and upsetting the Portuguese because they're like, you're Indianizing our faith. Our faith to be Christian is to also be European. So in Goa, they would insist that you have in Indians don't wear slippers when they enter a house. You have to start wearing slippers. Mm -hmm. Squatting to urinate is not allowed. Habits also have to be changed. Your appearance has to be changed as per their view. Whereas this guy, Roberto, the Italian Brahmin says, no, I don't want any of these cultural aspects to change because I'm not trying to change their culture. I'm only trying to give them a new religion. And therefore, I'm going to take my religion into their system as opposed to imposing my system on them. 
which is interesting of course a lot lot of people on the right wing don't like it either they think he was this kind of sinister shady figure who was posing as an indian in order to get into indians minds and sort of engineer change in society which is i can see the logic there but i don't think it was done in that kind of a sinister uh, sinister tone and that is why he becomes the italian brahmin he becomes a guru when he goes to royal courts they receive him like any other sanyasi they wash his feet he sits on the what is it deer skin or whatever animal skin these gurus sit on he transforms himself into a guru and from there the madurai mission continues that tradition so even in the 18th century you have fathers living they 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 catholics but they actually living like brahmins uh, you have even now in parts of tamil nadu etc you have uh, Christian Catholic fathers who wear saffron robes. I remember a Times of India article a few years ago, 2019 or so, where there was a scandal because fathers had come out during a Christian festival. I think there was some arti happening. There was a tikka on their forehead and all of that. And some groups said, "Why are you appropriating our religious traditions?" Whereas they were like, "This is how our Christianity has evolved in the region." And frankly, in Kerala, from 50 to C, if legend is to be believed, but definitely for a thousand years, that's how Christianity also evolved there. Which is why you don't hear of anti-Christian or Christian Hindu riots, etc., in Kerala, because culturally they operate within the same codes and the same infrastructure and the same system. Well, if a church procession is passing by a temple, it will stop there. There'll be some ritual happening outside, or if a goddess is passing by a church, she'll also stop there. They'd have some exchange there. That kind of an ecosystem is what Roberto was trying to recreate in Madurai in the 17th century, and he had a fair measure of success. And in the process, became became this Italian Brahmin who was yeah. born in Monte Monte Pulciano in Italy, but ended up dying in Madurai as a sannyasi. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, you know, fascinating story. I had never heard of this, and. most of the actors that you'll see in that book i don't think any of you would have heard so you know highly recommend reading that uh and finally your last is my book for starters it's it's his book it's what i call my airport reads book which is because a lot of students would say that you know people come for events and they say we like your talk but your 700 page book is too intimidating for us to pick up so i said well then i must respond to that right and as i said i'm not going to sit on a high horse and say that i will only write uh, ultra serious things if people need something almost like a beginners course for indian history i will supply that so these are short essays nothing is more than four pages you can dip into any essay at any point in the yeah. book if something bores you move on to the next that kind of a thing the fact being that if a book of essays does not overwhelm you then maybe the next time you'll pick up one of these tomes yeah. without fe- feeling afraid or without feeling yeah. that sense of so intimidation the book in black and white here is uh, the beginner's guide to dr you know manu pillai uh the last book the most recent book which is on the princely states of india uh false allies as it's called tracks you know a few princely regions of india through the eyes of very famous artist uh, ravi verma uh how did you why did you pick you know this particular artist and what governed the choice of these particular you know regions because it, we, we keep hearing there are 500 princely states right uh so tell us a bit about the thinking about you know why this book came about So again, because there were five hundred princely states, I didn't want to select states myself because then there's a bit of a bias that may creep in. For example, if my point is to suggest that the princely states were interesting, then I might implicitly go and pick up the more interesting princely states to support my point, right? Which is not the way to go about it. So I wanted to neutrally select a, a few states and study them. And Ravi Verma, as it happened in the late nineteenth century, was a very popular society painter. All these rajas were inviting him to do portraits and so on. And I found that he had covered Travis Bond in Travancore. He his career began in Travancore. Then he goes to Tamil Nadu, where his first commission from an outside state happens. It's Pudukkote. Pudukkote in Tamil Nadu is a tiny state, one thousand two hundred square miles, but ruled by rajas who are colours. Colours basically, the British called them a criminal tribe of robbers. The word colour or kallan in Malayalam also means thief. So here you are not seeing. Highly Brahmana and Shatriya kings. You are seeing kings of the robber caste in power there. So very different state, very different structure. Travancore is highly bureaucratized. Pudukkote is all very feudal, and it's based on this clan system. So I thought already I've got a, this through this one artist. I've got two very different kinds of states to study. Then he goes off to Baroda. Baroda is in Gujarat, but it's ruled by Marathas, which has its own internal dynamics where. foreigners or the word foreigner wasn't used for the british it was used for the maratha elites because local gujaratis thought why are these maharashtrians here ruling us and the, till the late 19th century till sayaji rao the, the third was in power there was tension between maharashtrians ruling over gujaratis because there was an ethnic and and whatever a cultural difference there again a different kind of system then he goes off to mysore mysore is in karnataka again it has its own unique history tipu sultan then the resurrection uh, the resurrection of the wadiyars and so on and finally udaipur that's one of his last commissions in north india 
uh, which is a Rajput state. Rajput states, again, there's influences from the Mughals. There is internal uh, hierarchies where the Rajputs have subordinate Rajas under them, clans, this and that. So I thought Ravi Varma helped me select five states, each of which was distinct and each of which I could study on a, with a neutral eye because I didn't, I wasn't going in with any preconceived ideas. It was a discovery for me. And yet my core thesis stood, which is that all these states were interesting. You, you mentioned the 500 states, right? So this is a, a cliche that India had 565 states. 60% of these states were spread over 7,000 square miles. They were not states. They were just like chota mota landlords with 10 acres, 20 acres, 300 acres yeah. in Kathiawar. Most of them in Kathiawar or in central India. 7,000 square feet, uh, 7,000 square miles is all that hundreds of states occupied. The real states were about 100 to 120. This 500 number is already mischievous because it gives you the feeling that you throw a stone, you hit a Raja in India, which is not true. There were serious states which had huge populations going into millions of people, massive revenues. They had their own coining and mints. They had their own systems, economic networks, etc. Those are the states I was interested in. Now, normally, if you read about the princely states, what you get is a package of cliches. So the Nizam of Hyderabad was called His Exalted Highness. Why? Because he donated money to the First World War effort. He, of course, donated it because he wanted some land the British had back and for it to be merged back with the state. The British didn't give him the land, but they gave him a fancy title. They said, you will not be His Highness, you will be His Exalted Highness. There's a story that the Maharaja of Patiala was so into women that he had 350 wives. And if the Nizam was called his exalted highness, Maharaja of Patiala was called his exhausted highness. So <laughs> these were these were the kinds of names that went around, uh, stories that went around uh, with princely India. The impression you got was a caricature version of history. These were just these relics from the past, constantly sitting in, in you know, dressed in silks with their pearls and riding elephants in the morning, riding elephants in the evening, oppressing their subjects in the morning, oppressing their subjects in the evening. That is the cliche that you got. But already when I was doing my Travancore book, I realized it's not entirely accurate because that's a small princely state in Kerala, a major princely state in terms of prestige, but 7,600 square miles. That alone, there was so much to study in terms of caste dynamics, political dynamics, communalism, how the politics operated. Because the British were not directly present in Travancore. Travancore politics was built on caste. You had the Brahmins who constituted one section and they were a small minority, but they controlled all the official posts, or most of the official posts in the state. You had the Nayas who were the dominant landed community who resented the Iravas because the Iravas were coming up from below. They were an Avarna or a, 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 a marginalized community and they were coming up from below, but they were also economically active. So they used to make coir products and so on. Earlier, they would make it for their feudal masters, but thanks to colonialism, they started exporting it. So suddenly the ropes you're making, the mats you're making, there's an international market, they started getting cash. So they started buying land from the Nayas, which triggered political issues between the Nayas and these people. Then there were the Syrian Christians who were traders, planters, etc. These guys were the next uh, puzzle piece of the puzzle. So politics in Travancore was not oriented around the British nationalism, any of that, it was oriented around caste. And even now, if you look at local Congress politics, there are factions based on caste and religion. There are Naya leaders, there are Christian leaders. That's how it's done. Because that tradition has still carried on into the 21st century in this democratic system. So to understand today's political factions in Kerala, I actually have to go back to Travancore's communal and caste pol politics in order to understand it. So one princely state showed me that there was something complicated happening in the princely states. And I started studying these other states, it became even more interesting. For example, in Mysore and Pudukote both, for the longest time, you find the term foreign Brahmins. And I kept thinking, we're taught foreigners for the British, but here they're talking about foreign Brahmins because the East India Company for the longest time depended on the secretarial services of Maharashtrian Deshastha Brahmins. Deshastha Brahmins had all initially penetrated large parts of India when the Marathas had expanded. When the Marathas declined and the British filled the vacuum, they transferred their services to the British. So when Tipu Sultan and his family are kicked off the throne in Mysore. Tipu Sultan's minister, Purnaya, who's a Deshastha Brahmin, is retained by the British. There's a there's continuity there between who serves, between the next layer of power. And these Maratha Brahmins go around, they're the ones serving as bureaucrats in all these princely states. There is resentment against them. All the same, in a time when the British are in power and British ruled India and Indians are looking for Indian icons, in the princely states, they have those icons. Because these 120 odd princely states are places where no white man is, is in direct control. It is an Indian ruler with the Indian ministers, with Indian civil servants ruling Indians. It is Indian ruled India. People use the term indirectly ruled India. That is the British indirectly ruled it. There is some truth to it. 
but ideally the word or the term you should be using is indian ruled india because these rajas also pushed back they were not sitting there in their silks uh, being pretty all day they were actually fighting and they were also political beings who were serious uh, in their own way there was a book that came out the other day called dethroned by john zubriski and one of the i did a review of it and one of my criticisms was that he talks about how the british did not permit the maharajas to use the word throne they could only use the indian word gaddi Uh, you could not call your your children princes because the raja himself was not called king he was called a prince so that's why they called princely states uh, the ruler could only rule you could not reign because only the king of england could reign you were all rulers this was the politics through language but the question is how far was this obeyed in travel co i looked at when i was doing the review i looked at uh, some key state publications they used the word reign easily all over the place it's reign 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 occasionally a rule here and there everywhere it is thrown occasionally a gaddi is thrown in here and there so you realize that these are all avenues of politics what you're saying what you're not allowed to say travancore's official gun salute was 19 guns that the british allowed them so any time the king has his birthday he's allowed to fire 19 guns they used to fire 21 anyway 21 was the highest the british didn't permit it but they used to do it and the british also didn't object because this was never an un- it was an unequal relationship but it was always a negotiation it was never the case that the british could get away with whatever they wanted in the princely states and the ways of resistance were many you could bribe these british residents who were posted in your court sometimes you knew where they had illegitimate children and their their secret wives and the royal family would bribe them saying we'll take care of your children you better behave with us in a certain way in jaipur there was a rani in the 1830s Uh, her husband died and the next raja was a child so she became regent and she happily allowed all her courtiers to come and meet her and she would deal with political issues herself but every time the british resident wanted to see her she'd say oh no no i live in parda and i cannot see any man she uses parda strategically over there in order to uh, keep the white man out and keep the indians in in her, in her camp you have this case in shavankor where the rajas sent some kind of you know news from madras which is not something he likes so now usually at these darbars there be a proclamation in english and a proclamation in malayalam and he said can we avoid the malayalam proclamation so british said absolutely not your subjects must be we've got you where we want and we are asserting our control over you he says oh, okay fine if you insist i'll have the malayalam proclamation read so he has the malayalam proclamation read but nobody who understands malayalam is allowed in the room so he finds a way out of that corner they would feud over ritual and ritual is not so one of the things was Now, if you're sitting in a darbar. Uh, the resident or the British representative, they fight over whether the chair of the representative should be on the left side or the right side. The British would say it should be on the right side because the right is of greater honor. The left is not considered honorable. Interesting, no? Considering our political yeah. factions today, uh, but the British would say no, no. We want to be on the right side, and sometimes this could go on for decades. Shoes uh, in Hyderabad for three generations, the British demanded the right to wear shoes in darbar, and the Nizams kept refusing permission. finally there was memu bali parra who was a 3 year old child or something obviously he didn't have an opinion on this so the british finally got the right to wear shoes uh, uh they they the adoptions the british say would say that we will regulate succession into your states but as late as the 1880s in udaipur when the raja died and there was there was no heir the british wanted a minor boy because then there would be a regency they would control the state for that many years they could amend the internal dynamics of the state and therefore they always preferred small young rulers minors But the local darbar, without even waiting for permission, went and adopted a thirty-something-year-old man and installed him on him in power. It was too late. Then the British couldn't topple him. So there was all kinds of things happening in the states, which were all political. This was not when when the rajas and the British fight over chairs. They're not actually fighting over chairs. They're fighting over the symbolism of the chair. And if the raja acquiesces and lets the British dictate where the chair should be, he shrinks in the eyes of his own subjects. He shrinks in the eyes of his own people. and some of it is so comical in fact the in, in travanco in the 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 rajas would meet europeans and white people at 7 in the morning very early meetings and the reason was simple because of caste taboos they had to shake hands with these white people because there was no alternative ultimately white people were your political superiors but you would shake hand 7 o'clock because at 8 o'clock you had your bath so you would have a bath after shaking hands with the british and it was clear to the british also that this was a you know a way of putting them down in the name of caste and ritual purity they'd have the british would impose these uh, european tutors on princes and again in travancore they come up with rules like oh yes tutors fine but he cannot stand on the same carpet as the raja because the carpet sang the the raja's sanctity and sacred position will be threatened if a white man is is present around him so in small ways and in big through bribery through manipulation sometimes sometimes simply through fudging accounts uh, in jaipur state they were 
they modernized where they wanted to modernize. So the city was planned a certain way, gas lights were installed, a hospital was started. Great, wonderful modernization. But when the British said, now, why don't you modernize your record keeping and your accounts? The Raja said, no, I don't want to modernize my accounts because then you know exactly how much income I'm getting. And Jaipur's arrangement with the British was that if you have a revenue of over 40 lakhs, a certain share has to be paid to the British. So the Rajas modernized their street lamps and stuff like that, but they kept their accounts in the traditional way so that they could manipulate it. And for decades, the revenue was always 39 lakhs, 38 lakhs, yeah. never crossed 40 lakhs. And every time the British sort of grumbled about this, what, what would the Rajas do? They'd make a donation to some viceroy's wife's orphanage fund. They'd make some grand donation here or there, something in England they'd give to sort of get rid of this pressure from the British to actually reveal their accounts. So it is all politics. It is not just Rajas doing things on a whim. They were political beings. And that's why you have to sometimes, as with all history, you have to not just read what is written on the document, but also read between the lines. So there was an Indore uh, Maharaja, this is my last story, I know I'm giving a very long answer, but uh, there was uh, the Holkar Raja, Tukoji Rao Holkar III, he writes in 1877 when Queen Victoria has proclaimed Kaiser Hind or Empress of India, he writes a letter, a very fawning, obsequious kind of writing where he says, India was just a heap of stones till the British came and now the British have built it up into a, into a grand edifice. It's that same argument that the British made India and the British invented India and things like that. Now, if you read that record, and if I were to just base my judgment of the Kujira Holkar on it, I'd say, what a complete, you know, lackey of the British. But then you actually read what the intelligence reports and the private correspondence of the British says. And that constantly says he's notoriously disloyal. He's constantly uh, intriguing against the British with all the other Maratha Rajas. There's a young Raja who comes to power in Baroda. He's writing to him secretly saying, don't obey the British resident. You stand up for yourself, things like that. And he's called notoriously disloyal. So... On the face of it, he's saying wonderful things about the Raj, but behind the scenes, he's constantly subverting the Raj. The scholar Rahul Sagar told me that he once um, uh, imported some, I think something was being imported into Indore and under the name of machines or textiles or something. They opened the package and they found it was arm, arms and ammunition. It was not textiles and it was not machines or whatever. In in Sajara Gaikwad here in Baroda, uh, he some how much was it? About 17 or 18% of all the banned literature during the revolutionary phase of the Indian freedom struggle, bomb manuals, how to manufacture guns, etc., used to be produced in Baroda state because it was a prince's state, British police could not directly access. And these used to be published under these innocent titles like vegetable medicines and so on and exported from here to other places. There were all kinds of things happening in princely states. And even for contemporary India, communal riots were lower in the princely states, higher in British India. And this is from Ian Copeland's studies because, and because it's interesting. Princes, because they had a cultural investment in society, even if two communities were fighting, they could call community heads and almost like a paternal patriarchal figure who was part of that same social fabric, they could talk to these guys and diffuse tensions. A British collector was not in the same position. Firstly, he was from a different race. He sat much more like a, a, a sort of removed figure, did not interact with people in the same way, and therefore did not have that moral capital to weigh down and pressurize people to back off in times of tension. So, which is not to say princes were all happy during, in fact, uh, the good thing about John Zubrisky's book that I liked is partition. We think that partition was just things that happened in the border between Sikhs and people coming from that side, the Muslims and the Sikhs. No, Sikh Rajas aided a lot of the Hindu Mahasabhaites and the Arya Samaj and so on in pushing Muslims out. There, there was princely investment in it. In, 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 uh, in I think, Ajmer, uh, it was again a Raja who was kicking out Muslims from within the princely state and marginalizing them in that time. So it's not a happy story. All I'm arguing is that the princely states are an interesting story. It's not just about his exalted highness and his exhausted highness. Those stories exist, but they exist also on the British side. The yeah. British were not uh, some Drut Se Dule Hue type people yeah. either. Which, which brings me to this thing about you know, the what if spot. Uh, you have the princely states, which is roughly about 60% of the landmass of India and about 40% well, of the landmass and 20% of the population. Uh, so the first what if, you know, so if the British and the Europeans had not come, right, and I ask this as someone who teaches business history, economic history, you know, would India have really industrialized? It's a big open question, you know, if the British had not come, we hear about British exploitation and so on. Uh, but do you think India would have, like Shashi Tharoor thinks India would have gone the Japanese way? J Japan modernized substantially by the 1940s. Uh, my own sense, when you look at the numbers, you know, on literacy, it's it's pretty good in Travancore, but across the board, they're not that much, you know, substantive differences. So how do you see this? You know, what if the British or the Europeans had never come? Would we have seen far more economic development by, say, 1940s in India? 
or uh, you know what what are the potential counterfactuals how how do you, how does one even think about this so counterfactuals are very naughty we're not supposed to engage in them but uh, all the same i don't believe in this idea that we would somehow have managed to come into the 20th century as a democratic modern forward th- thinking republic or any of that firstly a map would have been very different uh, we we have no way of figuring out what that map would have been if the marathas had dominated india the map would have looked very different because they had come all the way to tanjore in the south they'd gone military escapades had taken them to the frontiers of afghanistan they'd gone to bengal you know up north malwa those parts so the marathas would have perhaps been the big dominant power but remember the marathas were not popular when they were doing this they were not popular in gujarat when they came they were not popular in bengal when they came malwa they were not popular because they were seen we were a multicultural society so when any one group dominates all the other groups there's bound to be tension and the tension existed on the maratha road so already we are going to see a situation where people are not happily getting along just because the british aren't here there was plenty of stress and political animosity and stuff happening even before the british in fact when the british east india company arrived in rajputana 1803 after defeating the marathas the rajputs welcomed them because the rajputs were so fed up under the maratha life for the last 50 60 years they they were just looking for some way to get out of it and the british offered them a, a, a way so they were happy to see the british and happy to see the marathas go so it, it isn't an indian versus foreigner argument sometimes the foreigner was actively welcomed into spaces because other indians were oppressing indians so we already have that complication there the the second thing is what would our language have been i mean till the british outlawed it persian was the language of transliteral communication in india so perhaps we would have been having this conversation in indo persian and not in english because that would have been the language through which the people in different parts of the of the country communicated but the other big thing is also caste ultimately whether we like it or not colonial modernity was disruptive it did lots of terrible things but where social justice is concerned i think british rule did enable a lot of people who did not have a voice to come up whether it is fully whether it is marginalized groups dalits etc having access to education for the first time earlier there were schools and people sometimes quote this on twitter saying oh there are studies showing that shudras had access to schools in india the category shudra by the way in south india does not mean lower caste nayars were the landed dominant elites are considered shudras uh because in south india we don't have that brahmin kshatriya vaishya shudra kind of category it is brahmins and shudras there are clean shudras or ritually pure shudras and then outcast uh, communities so shudra is not a term that suggests marginalization in in large parts of the country it actually suggests a caste position a seriously high caste position so that's one the so the other thing is a phule he went to a mission school it was under missionary education that he read thomas thomas paine and he imbibed ideas that came from the west and applied them to his local geography in maharashtra around pune it's the same with ambedkar it is in the british army that a lot of mahars managed to get employment as soldiers and that's why they celebrate the battle of bhima koregaon battle of bhima koregaon is east india company defeating the peshwas but dalit communities celebrate the battle because they don't see it as indians being defeated by british they see it as lower caste indians standing up to a brahminical state's power and there is validity to that a lot of english figures um, in 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 andhra pradesh telangana uh, do you look at arthur cotton Arthur Cotton statues are still garlanded on his birthdays. There is a Jayanti in that state that is celebrated. I didn't know this. I found out because when I was doing my research for Ivory Throne, one of the British residents was a man called Robin Cotton, C. W. E. Cotton. Sorry. So I went to interview his nephew, Robin Cotton, and Robin Cotton was very, very surprised. He said, "Why are you here to speak about Uncle Arthur? I thought you'd be Uncle uh, Charles. I thought you'd be here to speak about Arthur Cotton from the previous century because he was the big hero in the family. So much so that Robin Cotton and his wife had been invited by the government of Andhra Pradesh for one of these Jayanti." these and so on i've been told by people in andhra pradesh who've done research on this that there are puja rooms in the houses of farmers where even now they do puja to arthur cotton why because although he was an imperialist he brought an entire canal system into this region and brought water to their fields so for the local peasants there he is akin to god it doesn't matter if he's a foreigner so in a lot of places british rule is what triggered i think much needed change in india it triggered a new form of modernity modernity would have happened anyway we have people like sarfoji in tanjore who are mixing western knowledge but blending it into indian templates and trying to communicate it to students but these are small experiments you have in delhi also delhi college they call it the delhi renaissance and so on but i think that disruptive force and i think india needed disruption in the 19th century we needed to be shaked a little bit and, and, and sort of out of our stupor of sorts 
that I think happened because we got that jolt from the British. It was a negative jolt, certainly, but I think we needed that jolt. So I'm not convinced that if the British hadn't come somehow under the Mughals, we would have industrialized somehow under the Marathas, we would have created some kind of uh, pan-Indian structure. No, I don't think that is entirely uh, likely. We would have had some structure, but I don't think it would have been what we imagine as today's contemporary, modern, forward-thinking system that we uh, our founding fathers had in 1947 when they crafted all this. Okay, I'm going to open it out for questions in exactly one or two minutes from now. So if you have questions, please keep them in your mind and just raise your hand after that. So last theme for you. Now, I think you're uniquely poised to kind of address this big question because you've kind of covered the last thousand years in this book. Now, in popular discourse today, we often hear this phrase, thousand years of slavery, right? How does one see this? You know, I mean, A, was there really thousand years of you know, slavery, however people conceive this and how do historians, you know, receive this particular thing? Because it's a big thing. It You hear it almost daily. I've seen an Indian Express headline just last week, which said thousand years of slavery, right? Is it really true? How, 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 how do you make sense of this big phrase? Yeah, it's a phrase. And like most of these phrases, it's political in origin. See, initially there was foreign rule by foreign races. For example, the Delhi Sultanate, when it comes in, it's Turkic rule. That's why in Sanskrit texts also, you often find the term used for Muslims in that period is Turuska, which is you're a Turk, you're a foreign race that has come into this country with a completely different set of institutions. It's not just religion, right? As I said, religion can come. It came to Kerala and didn't cause any disruption as such. It's not the religion, but it's the package that comes of which religion is part. So there is political institutions, there is a worldview that is different, you hold certain things sacred, you don't hold them sacred, there's a racial difference. So there's, in that sense, it's foreign rule at the beginning. But very quickly, this changes. It changes not because people were large hearted, there is this tendency to think that to fall into two camps, either it's 1000 years of slavery, and people were just constantly killing each other in the name of religion. Or the other extreme is everything was syncretic and wonderful and people are just, uh, you know, like in Bollywood songs, holding hands and running around in a garden happily, Hindus and Muslims, you know, getting along. Both are, I think, a bit excessive. I think there was tension initially. You see that tension. Take even Kabir. When Kabir says neither the Turks or neither the Hindus have it, I will tell you the way to God or whatever. He's implicitly suggesting there are two groups. The Hindus are separate. The Turks are separate. Eknath, he does this Hindu Turk Samvad in, in Marathi. There also, you see, both categories are, are applied. He's not saying that, oh, it is syncretic, how wonderful everybody's together. No, he is referring to two categories. The Vijayanagara kings, when they call themselves Hindu Raya Suratrana, sultans among Hindu kings, they're appropriating the title sultan, but they're actively also appropriating the term Hindu and applying it to themselves to separate themselves from other sultans. So there's something happening there, which has got tension in it. So I don't think we should play down the tension. The tension was there. But even these foreign Turk rules, okay, rulers, etc. Even the Deccan Sultans, as I said, the ones who came from outside very quickly managed to start marrying local people, patronizing local culture, etc. For the simple reason that a lot of Islamic power was concentrated in urban areas. Now, if you want to, you've got a huge kingdom, you need to collect taxes. You're all concentrated in an urban area. You can't simply go out. There's no state power in those days. There's no, there's no technology in those days that allows anything, even communication to happen easily. You need local allies. And therefore, local allies are cultivated. Akbar famously does it with the Rajputs. And he does, it's not just tolerance, it is active acceptance and active. After Akbar creates a Mughal kingship that is a blend of Islamic ideas, but also a blend of Hindu ideas, a blend of lots of things. So the Jaruka Darshan, where the king goes and shows himself through a balcony every day to, to people, to his subjects, that's an Indian custom. It's not something that originally came with the Muslims when they came from outside. Uh, when he worships the sun, when he bans animal slaughter on certain days, he's conceding certain things to Jains. When pujas are done in his name, etc. Even Tipu Sultan sends Shivalingas to Sringeri because he wants pujas to be done and he gives specific instructions on how puja should be done to that those particular Shivalingas because he recognizes that the people respect Sringeri and therefore as king, I am expected to have that dialogue and to be seen as a king who patronizes Sringeri and he does that. It does not stop him when he's conquering Kerala to, from using jihadist language and smashing temples because there he's going in as a conqueror and he will use language that justifies conquest. So as I said, the tension is also there, but the better impulses are also there. The question is not one or two. It's not about either or. Both exist. The question before us is, in the 21st century, which is what we want to focus on for the way forward? If we're interested in that politics of revenge, then yes, I can find plenty of examples where temples are smashed, idols are broken, 
people have been persecuted in the name of religion sure but if we want to move on into the future and say this is what the past was but we expect the future to be something that we will shape it is in our hands how we want to design that future and there there are plenty of stories that people are constantly getting along uh, you have in in kerala we have this uh, temple in cherukutur i think that's the name of the place where if you enter the temple you'll see these bronzes of a man without arms that man is supposed to represent a local muslim who protected the temple from an invading muslim army and therefore is now commemorated inside the temple you go to shrirangam the biggest temple in 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 tamil nadu after the deity after seeing uh, ranganatha in the main shrine the next person you are supposed to visit traditionally is his muslim wife tulukanachar because tulukanachar is supposed to have been a delhi princess who fell in love with the deity and she has now been enshrined as a wall painting like a tanjore painting inside the temple Uh, there's a little barrier outside but if you go and peer through the bars you'll see tulukanachar and when the deity is brought there on his processions he's dressed in a lungi which is uh, the dress of the south indian muslim in the stereotyped way but that stereotype is used here to signify that he's now in his muslim garb with his muslim wife and he's given north indian food as prasadam and all of that chapati things like that in a south indian temple in tamil nadu uh, in i went to shabrimala recently but before you go to shabrimala at erumeli the first place where you stop is the mosque of wavar and wavar you know very to the discomfort of many people sound surprisingly like babar <laughs> but malayali says into wavar so you first see wavar all the ayappa swamis who go first stop at erumeli go to the mosque of wavar and then go to the temple so if i were to look for situations where people try to get along those also exist the question is therefore which one we are going to choose in the present it's not the story that one was true the other is false that is not accurate both existed tension existed violence existence existed but syncretic aspects also existed good things also happened i think the choice is for us to make therefore yeah fantastic thanks a lot for this okay open to questions you know feel free to raise your hand and we'll come about yeah start you just yes, just your name here yeah. ियन First, that's a great that that's a great question uh and the second one which is about who is a foreigner in especially in history i think i'm a historian who writes really li- likes to write well i think that's how i put it because i cannot for the life of me i i did my phd thesis that obviously is very much to the point and you end up using jargon for the simple reason that your academic supervisors are familiar with the field they're familiar with the jargon so i don't need to explain the story to them in a, in a detailed way they'll understand it in a crisp three sentences so their jargon is useful unlike chinmay who has the pressure to publish in in academic peer reviewed journals i have no such pressure i am interested in this audience in a broader audience therefore the writing matters also in communicating that history a certain way uh this whole foreigner question is interesting right one thing we should not underplay is that back in the day people did not have these massive labels that have these broad based labels of identity people lived fairly local regional lives if at all they moved they moved within certain circles there is not to say that people didn't move across vast expanses most of these did they spread across the country they just the brahmins under the marathas went all over the place and created the infrastructure the british used so on and so forth those examples exist but for most part for the longer arc of history people have much more regional identities so your concept also is relatively fluid now if you're living in kerala you can have an identity as a malayalam speaking malayali visa with the portuguese who come from outside and are clearly a different race different group but when say uh, uh, the the arthur bevis or the muslim royal family of uh, near kannur they write to the ottoman sultans to fight against the portuguese they will use their muslim identity saying we are also muslim princes against the portuguese you are the ottoman sultans you are supposed to be the caliphs of islam support us in our fight against the portuguese though the foreigner is identified using religion not necessarily race the third element is identifying through caste which is that uh, a brahmin in early modern india because a lot of brahmins by the way worked in islamic courts they worked later with the british and so on they were masters of persian they were masters of courtly islamic courtly practices a lot of brahmins would have much more regular intercourse with muslim rulers and muslim elites than with untouchable hind untouchable hindus so their caste becomes the question of who is allowed in and who is allowed out there's a new book by a scholar called divya charyan 
It's about a Rajput state, Marwar, in the 18th century. And it's fascinating the construction of the identity of Hindus over there. And she convincingly shows that the term Hindu was used to include, of course, upper caste Hindu groups, exclude Muslims, but also exclude low caste Hindu groups. Because Hindu was seen through a caste-based prism, saying clean castes that participate in temple culture of a certain kind, Brahminical norms, etc., etc., Sanskritized norms, they are Hindus. Everybody who doesn't is out. That includes Muslims, or it includes meat eating, lower caste groups, etc. Also, so identity, therefore, in the past wasn't one fixed label. It isn't even now. You know, even now within India, I can be a Malayali as well as an Indian. Outside India, when I go say to meet my friends in Germany, I'm an Indian there. They will not have any conception of whether I'm a Malayali or not. In Kerala, I'm sometimes often, in fact, these days, uh, troubled because I have an upper caste Hindu surname, and they say, "Oh, you're flaunting your caste pride, etc." In Kerala, so there is a there is a cleavage over there also. So even now, if identity can have multiple layers in which it operates, in the past where there was no technology, where people did not have that kind of face-to-face -face intercourse, that, that would be very different. As I said, these Deccan Sultans, when the Mughals came invading South, it's interesting, right, that they belong to the same religion, but they didn't see themselves as one. In fact, Aurangzeb used the language of infidelity against Shivaji and the Maratha, saying these are infidels, kafirs, and therefore I will conquer them. He uses the same language against the Deccan Sultans. He says, oh, Qutub Shah is a Shia, and all the Shias are heretics, and therefore I must conquer and destroy this kingdom. His mother is a Shia. So mommy can be a Shia, but my enemy king cannot be a Shia. His own nobles are Shias. Many of them fighting this battle, they are Shias. But that's also something he ignores conveniently, because there he uses sectarian differences within Islam as a mark of identity to separate the enemy from himself. So it is far more complicated than we think. And that's why people in the past, the idea of foreigner was something that kept changing depending on context. Okay, interesting also names in the ancient past, Yavana and then Mlech and different words uh, used are there. But also when Indians go outside, you know, this is in my migration research, we use the word Videsi for an Indian outside. But the word Videsi can also be used within India. So when Odia migrants come to Gujarat, for instance, you know, they say they're going with this. Yeah. And so uh, the ideas of what is territorial is quite different uh, across time. Yeah, at the back and then you. So, uh, my question is, how do you place a distance between your subjects uh, when you're working in the archives for years and years and kind of like begin to know them, begin to have this very close familiarity with them? And uh, when you're writing for a general audience, like how are you able to place this distance between them? Do you go back to yourself at a time when you didn't know them? Or do you like make a person read them? Like what is your process in terms of like just after having known them so intimately and then going back to a place where you're writing for an audience that doesn't know them at all. How, how yeah, that's a know? that's a good question. It's not an easy uh, sort of thing to navigate because you do uh, that book. The first book took me six years to write. I was 19 when I started, 25 when I published. I had a phase around 2012, 13 when I was extremely annoyed with the book, wanted the damn thing to get done one way or the other. I, I, I was telling someone the other day uh, in an interview that I could sit with an entire tub of ice cream and eat it in one go because I used to stay up till three o'clock at night to write because I'd work till eight o'clock, have dinner and then sit down to write. And at that time, all I could do, I mean, I had to stay awake, right? So ice cream, chocolate, these were the things that kept me up at night. So there's that kind of trouble in terms of getting the work done. The second thing is, yes, when you're, especially when it's oriented around key characters, you're, it's also a biographical exercise. You're trying to understand the world through their eyes without at the same time sinking into their prejudices, without imbibing their worldview. So it's a, it's a very tricky kind of dance. And there, I think the challenge was with the ivory throne, the protagonist, Setu Lakshmi Bai, lots of records, lots of information of an official capacity, barely anything opening her mind. So there was a question of reading between the lines. What was this woman thinking? What was her worldview? What was her inner world? When she was with herself alone, who was she? You know, that is the person ultimately you are. And I don't think even now I have convincing answers to that because I wasn't able to necessarily break that code uh, completely. So there's a challenge there. You meet heaps of people, of course, and they all tell you some charming stories. I got one nice story about how after independence, Setu Lakshmi Bhai sat with her, um, some, just her cousins or, or some relatives, and they went to Padmanabhapuram Palace, which was now considered to be in Tamil Nadu state. And, you know, freedom had happened, 10 years had passed, and she didn't, she didn't go to the police escort or any of those things, just went in a car. And when they went there, it was a Monday, and like most museums in India that are run by the government, Mondays are chutti. 
So the man sitting there, someone went and checked and he said, I get lost with, you know, a chutti day or whatever. And the man said, oh, you better come and see who's in the car. And he came and he saw the Maharani and he sort of bowed and let her in, etc. Charming story and all of that. But with stories, you also have to temper it with, you know, stories come out of memory. Memory sometimes loses track of which year, when it happened, what exactly happened. We also ourselves sometimes construct linear narratives. So if I were to speak to just a granddaughter of this historical figure or a descendant, they will construct a linear narrative of their ancestor's life. This happened, then this happened. This led to great things. That led to greater things. And they died and they were glorious people. Story done. It is through engagement with other things that you find gaps. You start identifying those gaps and actively looking for those gaps. In that process, you can sometimes, yes, hit walls. It can be frustrating. You can sometimes perhaps lean a little bit too much into their worldview, and then you have to sort of pull yourself back. I think repeated work helps. Sometimes gaps help. So if I did one draft of the book or a set of chapters, I abandon it for say months on end, and then I come and read it with fresh eyes. Because when I read it with fresh eyes, suddenly I'm able to see better my own failings, my own sort of incapacity in terms of making certain arguments, where the evidence is proving weak, where it needs a little bit more research, that becomes clearer to me. The current book I'm working on, I did half of the book in 2020, abandoned it. Then I finished False Allies. False Allies got published. Now I'm doing the other half. And having written the other half, I've gone back to edit the first half and I'm completely rewriting it because a lot of things have now changed by the time I've reached the end of the argument. So I think simply giving yourself time and patience also helps with navigating some of this. Yeah. Eating ice cream in general. <laughs> so that's not good for, so, for health. So it's most things. Yeah. He has a great fitness routine, by the way. Yeah. If you're not following him on Instagram, please do. No, no, don't follow me on Instagram. It's yeah. my funny place. I'm not a very serious person on Instagram. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe first there and then here. Hello. So all the four books cover different theme, context, time period, and here we see how you are interested bridging the gaps of the overarching narratives from the lens of social, political, and cultural. Uh, can you share a few instances on what diverse kinds of primary sources did you delve into across your research? How did you trace it or challenges if you have faced? Yeah, this is actually the best part of research, just finding the material. The other day, someone asked me, do you go in with a prepared argument or do you actually let your evidence guide you and i think the second is the ideal way of doing it because you never know what you'll end up finding in the archives one of the reasons i grew so interested in the dynamic between the british east india company as well as the raj and the princely states is just when i realized when i was doing my first book how much the british empire ran on gossip because these british residents every two weeks would send a report to delhi about what was happening in the princely state so much was just gossip. It was literally like a gossip column in a tabloid paper today. Or at three o'clock that night, the Maharani went and saw X person in a secret place. Uh, I hear that certain pujas were conducted, black magic pujas were conducted. These are my sources. Because knowledge is power, all kinds of knowledge. And this is what intelligence reports are in great measure even today. You look at WikiLeaks files, you see how much of it is also about you know funny things and comical habits and things like that. And that made me realize that the archives are a fascinating space. You can do studies on how residents operated. You can do a study on how colonialism operated through knowledge and, and knowledge as a source of power. You can study politics through princely states. Simply the depth of the material gives you a sense of the avenues that are open to you in terms of historical research. And there are so many scholars who are doing specific granular work on those exact things. There's a, there's a lady called Callie Wilkinson who's now, it's published as a book, but she did a thesis on the residency system, how residents operate, and she's identified different phases. And in earlier periods before the telegraph became uh, accessible in India, Residents, it would take weeks and months for news to reach from wherever their bosses sat. So residents had a lot of leeway in deciding things on the ground. But the moment the telegraph comes in, things change because now communications are quicker. So you have to report on everything back to your bosses. So suddenly the residents' power reduces and Delhi or wherever else their bosses are sitting, they start having greater control on what is happening on the ground. So just that arrival of technology changes things. Archival sources are again of all kinds. There are the written sources. There is the oral history that comes through people, especially if it's recent history. There are people who know who are, who are alive, who've known these people. Uh, even your project with Kamala Chaudhary and Adi Ayam archives that they're doing here, they're actually doing an oral history section as well. Things like partition. This is an example I give often because if you study just through disembodied facts and statistics, you get a vision of partition. Yes, X million of people displaced. So many women were raped and violated. You have to leave all kinds of that, that comes as numbers. But you read literature written around that at that time, read Manto's short stories, you get the emotional trauma of that period in literature written 
in the same period. You look at Achal Marotra's collection of oral histories and what migrants brought with them when they were leaving Peshawar or Karachi or wherever they lived. They would sometimes hand over the keys of their houses to their neighbors, saying, "We'll come back once all this is done and and sort of you know take repossession of our things." They never went back. So those keys suddenly have a very different meaning, emotional meaning, having come to India even after seventy years. So that kind of oral history gives you a very different thing. Art, art is the other the you know great uh, source. So Krishna Deva Rai or Vijay Nagara, a contemporary, I think a Portuguese guy or a Dutchman, describes him and says he's got smallpox uh, marks all over his body and he's kind of stout, like he's a kind of hefty man. But then we look at the bronze that he donated of himself and his wives in Tirupati. It's interesting. It's a sleek, typical that not the, the South Indian bronze style, where a slightly different vision of the king appears. This guy idealized, you know, bronze style person appears. Tipu Sultan. You look at Tipu Sultan's uh, mural painting depicting the Battle of Kolhapur in uh, his summer palace in Sri Lanka, Patna. You read about the battle through records. Sure, you've got the battle, but you go and visualize how he wanted you to see the battle, and his propaganda comes alive because you see he is shown sitting on this oversized horse, smelling a rose in the middle of carnage. There are chopped off heads, chopped off arms as bloodshed, but Tipu Sultan is very gracefully sitting there, smelling a rose as if he's in a garden, and the English colonel is shown. In the opposite way, he's shown sitting in a palanquin chewing his nails because that piece of art is trying to communicate how Tipu Sultan wanted you to remember the battle, and that's that's where art comes. And uh, William Dalrymple has written about how a lot of the art, or uh, in, in in the Anarchy, he in his book the Anarchy, he talks about how when the British got the Diwani of Bengal from the Mughal Emperor, it was actually done. They had to put together some dining table, put a cloth on top of it, read an armchair. Emperor sat on that, and that's how he gave them the Diwani. But look at the paintings that are that are built around this event. Grand, the bar, and there's like flowing curtains and lots of like a very beautiful scene. This didn't happen in a beautiful scene. The handover of Tipu Sultan's sons as hostages. There are grand paintings depicting it, but those are all propaganda works. So you need to look at the art to understand what people in that time wanted to communicate about a historical moment. Now you need to operate through all the archives and the other sources to understand what actually happened. You have to read between the lines and then finally reach a conclusion. It's never a full conclusion. No historian can ever say that they reach the truth. That my truth is the truth. It is a version of the truth. It is a version based on the evidence available to me. This is how I have connected the dots, and I think this is a compelling. Vision of the truth. Someone else may have an even more compelling vision of the truth. In which case, the whole event gets revised. So this is again a constantly evolving field, and so long as you're open to multiple sources of all kinds, I think the field itself just becomes richer and the argument becomes stronger. Yeah. Uh, so, professor. So, professor, thank you for this uh, talk. Uh, my question was uh, along certain similar lines that some people have already asked. So. uh i am a pgp2 student here but i take a lot of interest in qualitative research and interpretive research methods so i wanted to ask you about uh, the exercises that you do in reflexivity and examining let's say your own situatedness in in doing these researches so for example uh your 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 malayali background combined with growing up in pune because i also have lived in pune for 8 years i'm actually from khadki or sambhaji nagar as it is today how do you try to unmoor yourself from the prejudices or the belief systems that you might already have and how does that uh, so how does that interact with your research so how do you influence the archival research that you do and how does it influence you back i'm interested in knowing about the process well the first thing is to admit that you will never be a completely unbiased uh, figure because no matter how much you attempt to be unbiased it's always an effort your making an effort to produce an unbiased picture of the past but nobody ever succeeds fully because we are also creatures of this time and space i was raised in a certain place as you said i was malayali i grew up in pune i was born a man which makes you lucky in our country because the world is designed for men that itself changes your perspective a certain way uh, i i i was born into a certain caste community that would have affected the way that that affects even the topics that might interest me right if i was born into a marginalized community perhaps i would not be so interested in kings and high politics i'd be interested in mass movements i'm simplifying but you see what i mean right so obviously we all have our subconscious biases but we are trained over time to minimize those biases sometimes though i think it can also be a strength for example my south indianness gives me i think almost an emotional investment in wanting to reorient history away from delhi because i fully believe, believe the delhi orientation has eclipsed so much of south indian history that's important to have 
to sort of recenter ourselves towards the peninsula and therefore look at history as a whole from a completely new perspective there i think it's a bit of an asset that i'm actually not bound by these the, the north indian shackles as it were but instead have a slightly different view because of the geography i come from uh, that does not mean that when i write about north india i only write negative things there, there that that becomes a bias that becomes an active bias where you think nothing of value happened in the north that's not true either it merely is an effort to try and operate through this whole system in a way that the earlier dominant gaze is replaced or at least challenged by a different gaze in and that 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 play between two different gazes itself produces something interesting and something new so there it can it can prove to be something of an asset in other cases i think yes a lot of it is frankly just self reflection uh, some of it uh, on gender if you've read feminist literature it's very difficult to go back because then anything you're dealing with in the archives you're always wearing your feminist lens and you're always looking at through at it through the the feminist gaze because you've realized that that is a major gap and that itself opens up lots of things uh, one example i typically give is about historians working on the moguls so jadunath sarkar's generation they worked with what they knew and the patterns and the, the trends of their time but they didn't give too much importance to women in the mogul courts it's now in the last 20 30 years that feminist scholars have started looking at women in the mogul courts and suddenly they've realized that these women weren't just sitting in harems uh, perfumed and sort of lounging about all day they were diplomats they had their own cavalry ranks they had huge trading enterprises they had a direct political role to play they were not just sequestered and put away uh, as women they were political actors also and there i think that kind of a fullness of feminist readings of history helps you also to cross over that barrier so some of it is conscious some of it is not so conscious some of it in one context may work out to your advantage such as a north south divide in other contexts perhaps it might eclipse you or eclipse certain things from your gaze because you're so uh, keen on south india that you perhaps don't notice certain things that happen in the north so it's an ultimately you're also evolving with each book and each project so i think every time i'm doing something i'm also improving with time i am also changing gears with time and as i get older i will hopefully get better and these things will become more and more clear we don't go into anything with all the boxes ticked right right we go in with a number of boxes ticked but a lot of things are still empty and we have to then make the effort to tick those boxes also as we go in the process and it's entirely natural for historians where say you write a book in 2015 and i write a book in 2050 there is every chance that my attitude will have changed my language might have changed on the same subjects my opinions might have changed sometimes because new evidence has come sometimes because i have evolved as a person that can also happen because we are also ultimately human beings and i think that's also what brings magic to it and that's also brought brings debate into it because so much as us as human beings present here and now trying to connect dots again a typical example i give is Jadunna Sarkar's generation didn't look at the feminist angle. We look at the feminist angle, but very quickly, perhaps in another twenty, thirty years, there might be an LGBTQ perspective which we have not yet brought on board. And that awareness of or having that filter means that you start identifying things that our generation is currently missing because we're not even looking for it, right? So these things are evolving, and so long as we evolve with the with the times and our perspectives are open to change, I think we are uh, we're not in a bad place. Yeah, I mean, a classic example is on campus itself. We have a subway pass. and we have an exhibit out there and the first exhibit it says the men behind it all you know uh, it's 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 a living testimony of uh, the creators of a particular historiography of our own campus right and even though there was a woman right at the start who started who pretty much for the first faculty member of ima and you can see even out here the history which was created was set up it's a it's a walking you can you can go today and see the subway pass it's still there unfortunately we, we plan to change it <laughs> um but uh, but if you go to the dom 15 if some of you are coming from outside we have an archives we have a gallery space it's a very different treatment from you can just compare those two exhibits to see what he's saying the evolution you know process okay we're running out of time so two short questions and two short answers yeah first Thank here yes, and then there. yeah yeah just with the mic yeah all right um I don't have. You can you can respond later. Uh, two questions: the princely states and the idea of the state. How much does it correspond to what we today understand with the modern state? Is there an idea of citizenship as well? Second, more methodologically. Sorry, is that too? Uh, how do you deal with the question of ambiguity, uh, especially for the given the audience that you're writing for, who perhaps wants it more digested and chewed up? How do you then, you know, also bring in all the ambiguity that is bound to be there when you're doing historical writing? Yeah, short answers. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> on the on the idea of the state, yes, it existed, but not necessarily in the modern state as we know it today. But these things are also not monoliths, right? Like there are you see things evolving over a period of time. So in 18th century Travancore, you do see that the Raja Martanda, although he creates it's all centered around kingship, he does tend towards centralization. There is a wiping out of hereditary fragmented power, and its replacement or the effort is to replace it with centralized power. With the British coming in, that process is actually, it becomes faster and swifter. And you see a more bureaucratized state coming into Travancore, into Kerala, which is why the Kerala ends up having this really good bureaucratic structure in southern parts where the princely states are active, as opposed to Malabar. And Malabar was under direct British rule, but strangely did not evolve a sophisticated uh, system over there. In other places, like in Pudukote, there, there is a lot of stress around this. So the Kallar Rajas, the whole state is divided among their relatives and clansmen. And it's a Tamil Brahmin called Sheshaya Shastri, who's been educated in the British bureaucracy democratic system who actually thinks he has to invent a state here almost completely. But what's interesting is when 1947 happened or in, in the late 40s, we use the word plebiscite typically, typically in the context of Kashmir. The people of Pudukote wanted a plebiscite because they were so invested in their borders and the identity of the state that they thought that the state should be retained and that identity of Pudukote and its physical bounds should be retained. So that process of a clan-based system where it was feudal lords and loyalties were linked to specific feudal lords, whose loyalties in turns were linked to the, was it in turn linked to the king, that gets replaced with a modern state. And finally, the king as an embodiment of a much more a different form of power. The king becomes a kind of bureaucrat king, and you have a modern state system present there, and the people are now invested in that modern state system. Mysore is similar. Rajputana is opposite. Rajputana states, the, the, what's his name? Uh, Fateh Singh of Mewar is actively against developing modern state infrastructure in his state. He does not want roads. He says, if my people have lived without roads for 800 years, why do they want roads now? He actively says that. Railways, to just get him to extend railways from Chitorga to Udaipur, he refuses for decades because he does not want that kind of transparency. He does not want to upset the older Rajput systems in which, again, it was clans and groups and so on. He's centralizing, but he's centralizing in a feudal way to himself and using the feudal in the loose sense of the term, not the academic sense, but he's using it to center everything on the king, but using the old networks itself without succumbing to a Western modern state as we uh, now know it. The second thing on ambiguity, I think acknowledging that things are ambiguous in certain parts. Like I think you just actively have to say it and remind people that ambiguity is not a bad thing. It does not need to be this or that. Sometimes it is an and, sometimes we simply don't know. Sometimes we simply don't have the information and we are connecting the dots. And you, so long as you admit that you're connecting the dots and this is how you're connecting it, I don't think people have an issue, even if it's, you know, uh, writing for popular audiences, because, you know, actively, if you look at, forget the trolling on the internet and that kind of internet wars over history. When it comes to the people who actually read books, they're very open-minded about these things. And so long as you acknowledge that this is how far we know, but not beyond this. And strangely, we have certain things we cannot explain. I think people are open to, to accepting that. I was reading Patrick Oliver's new book on Ashoka, and the book has so much of this, right? Ashoka's inscriptional corpus and his own words are less than 5,000 words. To write a biography based on those inscriptions is a lot of reading between the lines. And every now and then he reminds us that this is how it may be, and this is how he's reading through it, through these inscriptions and through these patterns. But not necessarily that. It's open to, it's open to debate. But that acknowledgement, I think, has its own value. Okay, last question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm louder. I'm louder. Close to him. I'm Tanya Uja. I'm a first year PhD student in public systems group. So um, a few days back, I was alluding a historical event to uh, someone in a conversation, and I was creating an analogy. So he told me, "Don't be a prisoner of the past." So I came across this brochure of yours for this talk. So I was quite intrigued. And my question is that, um, like you also talked about, which stream of history we choose determines what our present is. And um, But I also feel that who writes history, why, and for whom, and, and for with what agenda is also very consequential. And if this um, neutral history is so elusive, then how do you differentiate between history and literature? So the, you can't dispute facts. For example, India became independent in 1947 is a fact. Now that if somebody comes and disputes and says, no, that we did not actually become free then, etc. That you can easily say is, is unhistorical, right? 
But there will be debate on how we reached that point in 1947. There will be different perspectives on what led to that point in 1947 when we became free. That is where the debate arises. And frankly, there you don't necessarily need a neutral view. There, in fact, having that kind of rich dialogue, rich debate and engagement with the past and trying to come up with different things that influenced that particular moment or led up to that particular moment actually makes us understand the past in all its complexity. The past is not a picnic. It is not an easy place. The past is not some place where we will be comforted. The past is actually an extremely complicated place and it will often leave you with more questions than answers. And so long as we go, go in with that open, with open eyes like that, I don't think it should affect us in any way. But what you were saying on multiple narratives, right? This is not something that is just something that's happening in the present, where the same thing will have multiple versions of the truth, posing as the truth. This happened in the past also. So in Ivory Throne, one of the characters is this guy called Matanda Varma. Matanda Varma is often times or soon after there's a Sanskrit poem in which it says that oh, he conquered all these kingdoms in Kerala because God appeared to him in a dream, just as he was past, planning to become a sannyasi and just leave worldly material riches behind. God appears to him in a dream and says, you must renovate my temple and for that, conquer everything up to the Himalayas if you must, but that is why, that is your goal. And that is why he conquers all these kingdoms. So his kingly narrative justifies his actions by reference to God, saying God ordered it, therefore I did it. At the same time, you have local songs in a place called Nanjanad, which is one of these areas that he had to bring under control, but he's seen as a negative figure through treachery, through corruption, through just sheer ambition. He destroys all these fragmented forms of power and local chieftains, etc. over there. So you already have a counter view over there. The official narrative itself, you read, read subsequent publications by Travancore State, you start seeing the motivation behind Martha Norma shifting. At one point, they say that he did all this in because all these uh, this feudal system of the chieftains were all fighting among each other, the kingdom wasn't, wasn't strong. He wanted to strengthen the kingdom. By the 1940s, the claim has changed. It says that he knew colonialism was going to happen and to prevent colonialism from happening in large parts of Kerala, he had to unite Kerala under his banner and that's why he conquered all these kingdoms. So multiple narratives of the same event have always existed in the past and they will continue to exist. But so long as we read history, we are open-minded, we are able to engage with history without getting carried away with one narrative or the other and apply our own minds, that critical lens of not swallowing anything that's placed in front of you wholesale, but asking questions of that itself, saying, and applies to my books also. If you read my books, ask a question, who is this writer? Where is he coming from? He's writing in English. So what is his background? All of these things influence the text, but also look at the references. If you're not convinced by my argument, look at my sources. Then you can even ask questions of the sources itself. Why are these sources sitting in London, for example? Why are these coming out of British files? If it's in a British file, does that mean there's a slightly colonial prejudice or a slant to these documents? Has that been countered by somehow getting on board the local perspective? If you're aware of these patterns, then you are able to engage with these narratives yourself from a place of greater authority and strength. Uh, so I think the answer just is really more ultimately. The more you know, the better you are at navigating these things. Yeah, it's an interesting phrase, prisoner of the past. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can, I, I prefer the past is not a picnic. I must trademark <laughs> that. that phrase. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience and for enjoying my long answers. Um, thank you, Chinne, for the yeah. wonderful questions. This is the second time we're doing it. First time was 2019 in Hyderabad. In Hyderabad. Uh, Manu has written, Manu wrote three books before the age of 30. He had a target three before 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now I'm assuming it's going to be like 14 before 40 and a hundred before hundred or something uh, <laughs> but the but the influence is there <laughs> so it's going to rub on uh, hope, hope you keep writing and uh, i think we all look forward to reading these books and uh, everything that comes forward uh, going forward all the best yeah so the storytelling is already over i think and we heard the last word read more. okay so thank you uh, dr manu for taking us through such an interesting history and most probably you know we all enjoyed quite a lot and thanks to oh, professor chinmay for moderating the session